Welcome to the Furniture History Society podcast. My name is Elliot Sterling. And I'm Catherine Hardwick. We are both coordinators for the Early Career Development Programme. In this series, we will be talking to an international group of emerging scholars who will be discussing their recent discoveries around the theme of furniture, its design and materiality. Each episode will focus on an individual piece of furniture from 16th century Italy to Amsterdam in the 1930s. Garrett Thomas Reitfield became affiliated with functionalist architecture and from the late 1920s started to concentrate more on designing mass-produced furniture. He executed a number of shop renovations for the Dutch company Metz & Co who then, between 1930 and 1955, started to produce his furniture, including various models of the zigzag chair and the so-called crate furniture range. This chair is part of a line of inexpensive furniture made from low-quality wood, such as that used in packing cases. In order to keep the price down, the wood was simply cut and assembled with screws rather than any joints. This lounge chair model will occupy our fifth and final podcast episode, where I, Vicky Jenner, talk to Maud Willett, Assistant Curator in the Performance, Furniture, Textiles and Fashion Department at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Hello Maud. Hi. Okay, so did you want to go ahead and describe it for me and yeah, how would you describe it visually? It's a chair that's made of uh, wood um, and it looks very bulky in terms of constructions. You can see that it's made of um, planes of wood that have been like sort of like um, just uh, screwed to get there. It looks very handmade um, and as in it's not a refined design. Um, it has very low uh, seating, so uh, it's a, it's an easy chair. So the type of chair that you can lounge in rather than sit uh, very much like uh, straight at a desk or something. Um, and it is made of a type of wood that's not very refined. Uh, it's made of either pine wood or fir wood. Um, other sources say that it could be a red spruce. Um, so this is a type of wood that was uh, fairly available at the time it was made. Um, so it's a chair that was made during the Great Depression. Um, so it was a time of economic, but also material constraints. Um, so what Revel sought to do was, first of all, to find materials, but also to um, Find materials that were uh, cheaply available, um, that were inexpensive, and therefore would make um, inexpensive furniture for his clients. Absolutely. And I think this is really the nature of the whole object. It's fascinating the fact that it holds so much history uh, when you look at it just at first glance. It does look quite standard and quite simplistic, but actually, there is so much embedded within this piece of furniture within this chair it's not just a simplistic object it it is actually harking back to a time where inexpensive furniture was was needed could you talk a bit about sort of the context of the time sort of why was it made uh it was part of a series that was designed uh between 1934 and 1935 um which is the crate series it was a time uh, of the Great Depression, it was the interwar period. Uh, therefore, there, there were very few uh, materials that were available and, and people were very strained uh, economically. Um, so the company Reedville designed this range of furniture for, uh, it's called Metz & Co. And Metz & Co was a company that usually sold furniture to middle or class to middle class people because when people when people f- uh, think of Reedville they f- they often think of um the stale and the highly uh stylized like pieces of furniture he he designed um but less so of the crate furniture um and it's quite interesting because that's one of his most controversial type of furniture like per se um in the sense that it was fairly poorly received um, because it looked so rough and, and, and 
uh, and refined and um, and when he was very attached to that line of furniture and was really thinking um, that it was really important to to make furniture accessible to tool and so on the way um, Metz and Co would advertise this range of furniture is very telling of furniture inspired by wooden packaging or crates is not uh, always taken like uh, seriously or, or not always put at the center of the stage um Metsenko was like uh, advertising it as like weekend furniture or furniture for like holiday and summer houses so never the main thing or even like furniture for like student houses so never the main thing it's really interesting because it sort of taps into really relevant discussions and debates at the moment to do with sustainability and how we could ourselves be more sustainable um in our in our sort of social living uh how we can recycle and upcycle and so it sort of taps into that and it's 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 a really lovely choice yeah thank you yeah Great. Yeah, hope, yeah hopefully we'll learn more about how um those kind of pieces have been received as well because it hasn't been easy to convince people um to upcycle and maybe it will have a second generation after our podcast fingers crossed <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> it's called a crate series but it's not made from crates it's made from the same wood that was used for crates so that's um that's quite fascinating to think that you know if other designers were using crates because it was like a readily available material at a, in a time of need he thought that crates were so brilliant as a as a type of design that there should be the main inspiration for a piece of furniture. Um, and he, ha he has a really good quote, uh, which I can find again, if you like, because um, he received loads of like criticism about uh, about this line. And to that he answered something that I find quite amusing. Um, he said, a piece of furniture of fine wood made wholly according to traditional methods is shipped in a crate to prevent damage and breakage. Someone receiving such a crate at home says, at most, well packed. It has never been established that such crates represent a freely rendered method of carpentry and trade at its goal. The play materials of which it is composed make it stronger than its precious con contents. Therefore, there must finally be someone who chooses a crate instead of the piece of furniture. So it's kind of a love letter to, to the crate. Um, that's fascinating. And, he was really sort of in love with this material, wasn't he? Yeah, it was kind of like it inspired a whole range of furniture. And, and um, even though that line was kind of like pre-cut, uh, pre-cut wood, like kind of screwed together. If you look at like some of his furniture from like 10 years later, um, it still goes back to that range of furniture. And it's kind of like it's it's better finished in the sense of like, there are more joints in furniture or, or some of the, the wood has been um, cut a bit more finely, but it still comes back to this very like organic and geometric, very like geometric like structure. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. It's been quite like a, an important part of like, an important time in his career and like in his designs, I think. Um, Absolutely. It does say on the v &A entry, actually, that it was probably intended to have upholstered cushions. So it wasn't actually meant to, it wasn't designed to be sat on without cushions. So it would have been a bit more comfy. Yeah, it's, it's the one, um, that easy chair is the one piece that came with uh, upholstered cushions. Um, and um, it's quite interesting, the, the, the fabric he chose to for those cushions is one that's very reminiscent of um designs by uh the still um and but they were already part of the Metz and co catalog uh, of fabrics um so even though it's quite interesting with great furniture um another design that i'm talking about in my talk is louise brigham um she was making furniture from crates that, like immediately both Ridville and, and Brigham it's not because they're using furniture made from or inspired by crates that they're ready to sacrifice comfort um so for him it will it will come with uh, cushioning but it's also the way um the piece is finished so even though it's like this really rough um wood that's used as the primary material um it, 
there's some research that says that um, the 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 wood was heavily sanded, like sanded to be like very uh, smooth and um, like the the corners would like rounded off. So there is a sense of finish. Um, it's a type of furniture. It's like oh, the crate series, like the furniture is often like painted as well. Um, but that's not something he liked very much because uh, for him it was kind of a way to hide the the origin of of the material and therefore he thought that the design would like 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 a sort of like sincerity or or hon like honesty that was that was like seeking yeah i love that minimalism i was going to ask about the origins of the word do you know do you have any information about sort of where it was coming from where was it being imported or was it actually from from like a dutch resource i'm not sure about that actually um it's uh, i'm actually in conversation with our conservator to try to establish what type of wood or chair is made of um because at the moment it just reads wood which is not ideal um but some some i keep on reading about it and i see that some some sometimes the wood is um, describes fir wood, sometimes pine wood, sometimes it's red spruce. Um, so I haven't. First of all, we don't. We're not really sure what type of wood it is. So like, trying to find an origin for it, it's not something I, I don't. I don't know about it. Uh, yeah. Quite I suppose. Simple. I suppose doing research into uh, what was being widely accessible, which could be inexpensive, mm. um, would be interesting here, and uh, what was widely available at the time that would reduce the costs of import and that yeah. sort of thing. So it's a type. It's a type of wood that was used for for crates. So um, yeah, because uh, you know uh, export and transport were still going on. So that type of wood was readily available, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure where it came from. So I'm really interested in how far this object has had a reprisal within uh, the contemporary world today. So is there any legacy of, of this object? It's actually very interesting because uh, it's a design that's been uh, re-edited in between um, 1974 to 1986 by the Italian company Cassina. Um, so it sh it shows kind of um, its impact on on the design world and and how there's still um, an interest into this sort this sort of furniture even about like forty years later um, its first design um, and in parallel to that another thing that's really interesting to me um, is that when you know do some simple Google research um, and, you, and you type like um, palette design or uh, DIY with crates, things like that. People still do um, reuse that design as, as a model a lot. So that there are so many that you can find on Instagram and things like that. People really uh, reappropriated that design. Um, is, it, is it bad to say that it reminds me of an Ikea piece? <laughs> slightly <laughs> you know it's this whole um ideology of taking it on yourself and, and and being able to build something yourself quite easily at home and, and have something which um is very trendy and, and tapping into what is popular and a la mode at the time so uh would that be fair to say that it, it it's sort of also having a reprisal within the ikea landscape well definitely i think you know uh First of all, IKEA is really good at like picking up on trends and and have a feel for for uh, the moment. But I think personally, I think the success of the crate chair today is what didn't quite work at the time, which is that um, that roughness, that like homemade look, that DIY look that we are no very much seeking because. This is my personal opinion here, but I think we all have like jobs are like behind computers and we do very few things with our hands. So uh, no being able to say I've made this and this is a DIY thing it is a sort of like uh, um, a source of pride and, and sort of like a way to like elevate your status a little bit. Um, when I think when Reedville first uh, designed in that chair when it was first distributed um, maybe it was not too well received because because it was just reminding people of like how rough the times were and that's as good as you can get at that time.
but yeah, I think it was it was being criticized for the, for its lack of craftsmanship. Whereas, you know, it's almost something you kind of want to display because you can see you've made it yourself. Thank you for listening to the Furniture History Society podcast. This series was made in support of the Early Career Development Programme and Research Symposium. If you have enjoyed our podcast series and would like to become a member of the Society, please visit our website at www.furniturehistorysociety.org.